All right, we now move on to our next subject, that of mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry, or MS, is a technique that allows you to determine a compound's mass. For example, if your compound had a formula of C3H6O, then its mass would be 12 times 3, because carbons weigh 12. 1 times 6, because hydrogens weigh 1. And 16, because oxygen weighs 16. All added together gives you 58. So if you ran a sample of this compound on mass spectrometer, your machine would tell you that your compound's mass is 58. Now here's how mass spec works, more or less. We fire a compound down a column and blast it into a million pieces by bombarding it with electrons or sometimes other ions. The different pieces, which are now charged fragments, then travel down the column. The larger the fragment, the longer it takes to come out the end of the column. Thus, fragments are separated according to their mass-to-charge ratio, called m over z. The detector measures the fragments as they come out of the end of the column and calculates their individual masses based on the time it took them to travel the length of the column. This time is called their time of flight. Now you'll notice in this figure there's lots of crazy crap up here that I frankly don't care if you understand or learn. It just kind of shows you the different components in a mass spectral column. Now to show an illustrative real life example, let's pretend that we threw ethyl benzene into a mass spectrometer. It's possible that some of the molecules of ethyl benzene in our sample might get bombarded by a single electron to give this molecule, which would then come out of the column to give a molecular weight of 106.165. Because this molecule has the same molecular weight as the original structure from which it came, it's called the molecular ion, or sometimes also called the parent ion, or parent peak. In contrast, upon electron bombardment, some of the benzene, or the ethyl benzene molecules, might get dissected into these two fragments, whose individual molecular weights are shown. Our mass spectrum would therefore give one peak at 77 and another peak at 25, in addition to the parent uh, ion peak of 106. It would be even more common for us to see our starting material get dissected into, uh, by electron bombardment into these two fragments. The reason for this is because this fragment right here is a benzyl radical, which is the most stable of all of the fragments shown on this slide, because this electron can be delocalized by resonance into the benzene ring. This radical would give us a mass peak at 91, while the fragmented methyl radical would give us a mass peak at 15. I hasten to point out to you students that a methyl radical is not as unstable as a methyl carbocation. Thus, in a mass spectrum of ethyl benzene, we would expect to see peaks for all of these ions, as well as probably many more. The most stable of this entire mixture, which once again I'm expecting, would be this benzyl radical fragment uh, would give the tallest peak, which is called the base peak. Remember, though, that the tallest peak does not necessarily correspond to the molecule's molecular mass, or M peak, also called the parent peak. The tallest peak, or base peak, only tells you which of all of the fragments produced in the column is the most stable and hence the most abundant. The abundances of all of the other peaks are calculated relative to the base peak. Here's the mass spectrum for pentane, whose structure is shown here. The molecular ion peak, M, which once again is also called the parent peak, is shown right here. It corresponds to 72, which is the molecular weight of pentane. Now you can see, though, that the M peak is not the tallest peak in this mass spectrum. The tallest peak, or base peak, is 43, which corresponds to a radical propane fragment, C3H7. So apparently when pentane gets chucked into the mass spec, the most stable fragment that comes out the other end is this propane fragment right here. So now I'll teach you about a tool called UV-Vis spectroscopy. Basically, you throw a compound into a UV-Vis spectrometer, where it's bombarded in sequence by UV and visible light. The compound will absorb some of that light and transmit the rest. The transmission is collected and compared electronically with the initial emission, and a spectrum is produced. The one thing that I want you to know is that UV-Vis spectroscopy is used most commonly to analyze conjugated double bonds. To remind you what that is, this is called accumulated diene. That's where both double bonds are on the same carbon. 
This type of compound is called an isolated diene, where both double bonds are at least one carbon away from each other, or maybe more. And these types of compounds are called conjugated dienes, where every other bond is a double bond. Double, single, double. Benzene is also a conjugated diene. You can see that right here. We've got double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, all the way around the ring. Now, of course, we know that benzene's aromatic, so all of these bonds have a partial double bond character in reality. Conjugated dienes are the ones that show strong UV vis spectra, and that's what UV vis is most commonly used for. And now we arrive at standardized exam type questions. This will be easy. UV spectroscopy is most useful for detecting what? Next question, in mass spectrometry, peak abundances are measured relative to what? And this question, which of these compounds would most likely show a base peak at mass over charge equals 43? And last question, mass spectrometry separates fragments according to what? Let's go to our next questions. A compound is analyzed by mass spectrometry. Its base peak at mz over z equals 81 comes out of the most stable fragment. Which of the following is that fragment? The next one, the key fragment m over z equals 45 corresponds to which of the following fragments? And last question, a compound is analyzed by mass spec. It gives no parent peak due to the instability of that peak, but does give a base peak at 55 and another one at 31. What functional group does this compound most likely contain? And that ends this first lecture on UV vis and mass spectrometry. We'll go on in our next lecture to talk about NMR spectroscopy. Until then, enjoy.